Roy Lichtenstein is going to be one of the primary artists of pop art. He's one of the people that we think of whenever we discuss this movement. Now he starts off looking at different movements. He's emulating everything from neoclassical forms and more realistic forms to some of the ideas of Guarnica and Picasso in the 1920s and 30s or Picasso's neoclassical period. But as the movement matured, the images will become more concrete. And the artist here, Lichtenstein, will actually turn towards pop art. In fact, we have a diary entry where he describes changing over to pop art pretty much overnight, deciding that he wasn't doing well with these other forms, and so let's give something else a chance. And so what he's going to do is he's going to focus on comic books. And there's a reason for this. Uh, first of all, he wants to look at commercial art and comic books because he sees them as a mainstay of pop culture. To him, comic books are the ultimate disposable art. After all, leaving aside your uncle or brother or whomever else keeps a collection of comic books in the attic. Generally speaking, comic books were meant to be read and thrown away. But they have their own very specific visual language, and so he's going to try and use that. So he's going to look at these comics, he's going to borrow that visual language, something concrete, something that any American can look at and come to terms with very, very quickly, understand on a very concrete level. And he's going to use that to draw out similar ideas to abstract expressionism. So let's look at his piece, Hopeless, which is a copy of a comic book, which is in itself arguably a copy of an earlier anyway. You get the idea. There's a lot of copies going on, but he's doing something different with this. Now, first of all, when I show this to you, you should understand most of his pieces are between six by six feet as much as 10 by 10 feet. So this is a massive piece. And it is meant to be that way. It is playing off of those ideas of abstract expressionism, those massive canvases by Pollock, to take up all of your peripheral vision so that you have to concentrate on that piece. Now, what he's done here is he's borrowed or sampled an image from a comic book. We happen to know exactly which image he borrowed. You see it here. I mean, obviously, it's from a book cover that we're seeing it here on the left, but this is exactly the same image. So he's borrowed this image from a comic book, this discardable form, and made something concrete and permanent, something that is unarguably high art. In order to do this, he will use the visual vocabulary of the comic strip. Specifically, he will use bende dots. Now, bende dots are a way of blending colors. You use them in printing, especially in the 1950s, the 1960s, when you're using a color that isn't pure. So in other words, we have CMYK. We have four colors that we generally use in printing, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. And so when we go back real briefly and look at the whole piece, you'll notice that areas that are black or magenta or yellow are pure color. There are no dots there. But when we get to the flesh tones and other areas, he uses the dots. Now, I've blown up real Bende dots here in the upper right so that you can see the actual effect. This is how it works. This is optical blending. It's based on the ideas of George Seurat and the Impressionists, but it's used in this very broad form. So he's going to use that form a little bit differently because he's going to blend those colors to create his Bende dots. But it's the same basic principle. You read it as this massive canvas, and you'll know immediately that it's coming from a comic book. So he's using the visual shorthand of comic books in monumental art. Now let's compare it to a Pollock. Sorry, let's compare it to this Pollock. So we've looked at this. This is the piece from 1950, Lavender Mist. And when we look at it, Lavender Mist and Hopeless seem to be two massively different pieces. 
One is very concrete. One is very abstract. But think about it this way. When you stand in front of the Pollock, you're filling in a lot of blanks. Your mind is filling in those blanks. You're watching your train of thought. You're seeing what comes up, and that ultimately becomes your interpretation. Now let's move over to the pop art piece. And let's look at the text. Let's start there with something very, very concrete. That's the way it should have begun, but it's hopeless. Well, that's as abstract as the Pollock. What's hopeless? What should have begun? Now, immediately we see a female crying. Maybe your first thought is a relationship, but is it? Maybe she failed an exam. Maybe... Something else has happened. She tried to start a career and it didn't work out. Maybe any number of things happened. But he's left us concrete imagery to walk into this very individual interpretation. Depending on your own mood or your own experiences, the day that you view this piece will change your interpretation, just like with the Pollock. When you look at it, you are filling in your own blanks, just like the Pollock. And ultimately, you're simply reading your own train of thought and seeing how it changes and adjusts as you look at it, just like the Pollock. Very similar ideas, but they're two different paths, two very, very different paths to get there. And that's the beauty of pop art. It's drawing out these very deep, personal interpretations in the same way as abstract expressionism, but doing it in a way that will be more relatable, will draw in the viewer and make them more comfortable as they explore their own inner psyche.